However you are and whenever you are, welcome, good soul, to Paranormal Now. I'm Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Joining us tonight in the first hour is a special guest, author and experiencer, Whitley Strieber. Um, however, his joining of us is a pre-record that we did earlier this week. But as of this moment, we are live and the second hour tonight is live. In that second hour, we are joined by Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, um, exoconscious author and Ken Cherry, author of Mark Slade Investigates the Stephenville UFO. And I respect uh, and really appreciate Ken and Rebecca's opinions. So in that second hour, uh, they're joining us to give their unique perspective on the UAP task force and disclosure. Um, and of course, we'll take the conversation from there. Um, and of course, we all know there are multiple factions with opposing agendas working behind the scenes. The question is, you know, what are those agendas and who do we think some of those people are? Okay, so stand by for the Whitley Streamer interview, but in the second hour, we will have those open lines. So the call in line is KGRA 185 KGRA Live or 1 855 472 54. Eight, three. And of course, you can follow me um, on Twitter at Paranormal underscore now or on Instagram at Paranormal now for show updates. All right, Bill. Whitley Strieber and our guest Whitley Strieber is the author of over 40 works of both fiction and nonfiction. His books, The Wolfen, The Hunger, Communion and The Coming Global Superstorm known as the Day After Tomorrow movie, uh, were all made into feature films. His sci-fi series, Alien Hunter, became the sci-fi channel series, Hunters. In 1985, Whitley had a close encounter of the third kind. It led to the writing of the epic bestseller, Communion, that changed the way the world thinks about this enigmatic experience. And that's the absolute, absolute truth. When he eventually realized that the experience could not be attributed to known factors, he began making an effort to reconnect what he calls, quote, the visitors. The response has been ongoing for the past 30 years and has been chronicled in communion, transformation, majestic, and now a new world. Many people have encountered the visits, visitors with Whitley, Whitley, placing it among the most witnessed paranormal events in history. His website, unknowncountry.com, is among the largest in the world dealing with paranormal phenomena, and his podcast, Dreamland, has been produced weekly for 20 years. Whitley Strieber, welcome to Paranormal Now. Hi, how are you? I'm good, good to be here. Yeah, great. Thank you. Happy to have you on here as well. Um, there is so much going on in the world of ufology, uh, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about that. Sure. But before we, we get there... Maybe if you could introduce yourself a little bit to those who may be unfamiliar with your work communion, because I sure. think we're kind of going through a renaissance where there's a younger generation now looking back um, at some of the more popular aspects of ufology and important aspects of ufology uh, that they were not you know, privy to growing up like I was. Um, so if sure. you can share a little bit about this fantastic book, Communion, a true story. Yeah. Well, uh, much more familiar is the older version of communion. I, I've never known why they've even put that out with that cover, apparently uh, featuring a black hole over a farmhouse. This yeah, I was, uh, was going to ask you about that. Right? Well, I, I, I don't have any answer to that. This is the original painting of the face. It hangs on my wall. That is the face that changed everything. Because when Communion was first published, I, I did not understand this at the time, did not know this. But in fact, the face would trigger memories in apparently millions of people around the world that face, those big black eyes. And people thought of this, had thought of this as a dream of some kind. Mm -hmm. 
But it turned out that when they saw it on the cover of the book, they realized, my word, that was no dream. And they read the book and then began writing me letters. And we got hundreds of thousands of letters. Uh, they're collected now in an archive at Rice University in Texas. Uh, Whitley, if I could put that into perspective, this is before the age of the internet. So to receive that many letters, that that speaks to the, the volumes that were sold and the number of people that um, well, we reacted yeah. to that presence of that face. And right. that, yeah. the face is probably not exactly what I saw, but the eyes were just very distinctive. I saw those really clearly sure. in, the, in the encounter experience that I had. I had this on December the 26th, 1985. And as time goes on, more and more people are saying me, to me, that was before I was born. And I'm wondering, how old am I actually? I think, I think I'm 76. Am I 176? 76. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're, well, you're doing well, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, I'm really healthy. I'm that's a fantastic. very healthy guy. Um, uh, I have three very active grandchildren, so I have reason to be healthy. I need to be healthy to keep up with them. Um, so... I, anyway, I had this experience and it was very disorienting and tough. I mean, it was a rough experience. Yeah. I fought, if I hadn't fought back, uh, I probably wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been so uh, injured. I had a rectal injury, which I called, unfortunately, in communion, a rectal probe because I was so mm -hmm. embarrassed by it. I, it was a, basically a rape situation where I was raped by a using use of a device. It was a very powerfully intimate and up, up experience that caused a complete upheaval in my life. Sure. Because prior to that, I had had I probably had experiences as, as a child, but I didn't remember them then yeah. they had gone, they had disappeared back into the mists of childhood. And uh, so when this happened, that was just astonishing. I couldn't took me about six weeks before I realized whatever had happened, mm -hmm. it wasn't explained. Well, you know what I have always had a problem with? I, I wish I could say to all the comedians who made, you know, jokes over the years about that, um, to them, what if you were raped? You know, would, would you yeah. still be making those jokes? And I, and I think you, and you, you do make that serious, um, you use the word rape in in the book, so there's no misunderstanding I, I that it was an assault. In the book, a new world. I did not use it in communion. Ah, okay. Because I couldn't. Okay. I was so ashamed of it. It took me more than twenty years to even say that word to my wife. Understood. Okay. And yeah. to to be laughed at and lampooned. Yeah. For that, for all those years, was real hard, and it it changed my entire attitude toward the media and, and also toward the way we, we we deal with each other because in fact even to this day to a great extent the close encounter witness community are the last people who can safely be bullied and kicked around yes. uh, yeah you can't do that to any other social group and get away with it well, but you, you still can do it to us just well, now, it's ending now i will say that people are not so ready to do that to us anymore well, I was going to ask you that a little bit later, but since you brought it up, because of this more mainstream acceptance of the UAP uh, phenomena, UFO phenomena, does that does that soften the critique of the abductee or experiencer? Well, the mainstream media so far has re re responded to the situation by doing two things. One, following the government's lead and acting as if this sort of started in 2004, right. which is insane, of course. Yeah, and uh, editing out history. Right, and, and, and then they can say, they can hold out the, the, uh, the, 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 the little possibility that it might be something from Russia or China. Mm -hmm. uh, but under the surface, people are realizing 
these things are real. They are un, un, unknown and therefore unspoken as yet. Yes. But there is that the fact that these hundreds of thousands or probably millions of people have had close encounters. So in and, the, oh, go ahead. Well, in the, in the eighties, when, when you first, I would guess I would call it an awakening as, as to what was, was occurring to you, uh, happening to you, 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 in your hypnosis and your reflection, you discovered that this was going on perhaps since you were a child and that these yeah, beings were abducting you. In the hypnosis, I was, well, first of all, I, I was, um, I, I, I knew something had gone wrong and something had happened to me. And there was a long trajectory of a few months where I explored, was this a crime that had been committed against me? Was I assaulted and drugged? Uh, was, um, was it some kind of a mental thing or did I have a brain tumor? Sure. All of that stuff. And um, it was a very difficult time in in, in my life and certainly in my wife's life too, because I wouldn't tell her what I, I remembered because it sounded so absurd. And I finally told my doctor who had told me that I had been raped. And I said, look, Tom, I, I think I remember being taken aboard a flying saucer by little men, which is what I remember. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, let's do an MRI scan and a temporal lobe epilepsy test and uh, some psychological tests and see where we are with this. It all came back that basically I was healthy. And that's when I had to face it. And I'd been fighting with Anne, my wife, because I was afraid I was going to be locked into some kind of psychotic state and I would never escape from it. And then she would be married to a man that she couldn't divorce, who couldn't provide for her if I was institutionalized and incoherent. Now, in, in the book, a couple of times you mentioned that you use the word deep, and th this I'm confident of. You definitely use the word deep in describing your relationship uh, with Anne. Um, oh, and and wow. then that, and that's, how, that's how you got through. What, what does that mean exactly? How do you well, describe let me tell you that? About what Anne is like. I finally, I had a friend, uh, I still do, Timothy Greenfield Saunders, who was the first person, he's a photographer in New York. He was the first person I told the story to. And I said, I'm going to have to tell Ann. And he said, Ann will handle it. You tell Ann exactly what you told me. Yeah. And so I told Ann, and we'd been fighting because I was afraid that she would, I wanted her to divorce me because, I, but I couldn't, I didn't have the, I loved her too much. I would never be able to divorce her. And finally I said, honey, listen, I have something to tell you. And it was an evening in the country house. Yeah. And she was very nervous. So obviously, she she told me later that she thought I was going to say that we needed to split up. And I said, um, I think I've been taken aboard a flying saucer by little men. And she said, oh, thank God. I thought you were going crazy. <laughs> Wait. The best yes. <laughs> possible answer. From that moment on, Anne took charge and and formed the book communion she yeah. edited it she created the title she did, uh and the whole experience all of the letters everything and how we thought about it and how i spoke about it all started with Anne. let me just move this a little bit so you can see her up there there she is okay that's right. it let me get this bigger uh, uh she uh she passed on in 2015. An hour and a half after she died, she began to come back. I was sitting in the living room, just absolutely bereft, as you can imagine, with such an incredible close relationship to, we'd had all these years. And uh, then suddenly uh, the phone rang. I had been thinking to myself, Annie, if you still have any reality, please, 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 give me some kind of a sign and the phone rang and i thought oh i know but then i saw it was one of ann's friends bell fuller and i thought i've got to answer it i can't not answer the call because i know bell is worried about ann and she's she's gonna she's calling because of that and i answered it and she said whitley is ann all right she knew ann was sick 
And I said, honey, Anne died at 7.15. And she said, because I just heard her voice in my ear saying to call Whitley. And that went on with not with just with her, but with other people over the next couple of weeks to the point where I, it was impossible for me not to believe that Anne was still around. Yeah, yeah. And over time, she taught me how to get into contact with her. And I did so to the point that I now wear both rings, her ring on the small finger and my ring on the oh my right finger. Yeah, uh, on the theory that we're basically still together, only we, we're now down to one body in the physical world. <laughs> we wrote a book together after she passed on called Afterlife Revolution, which Gary Schwartz, the famous uh, 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 psychologist who studies afterlife stuff, said uh, of it that it was probably the best witnessed story of afterlife contact that he had ever read and wrote a forward to it. So it, you know, and this gets me to another point. One day, Anne came out of her office back when she was managing all these letters and she and her secretary, Laurie Barnes, and she said, Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death. Then years later, she had a near death experience. And she died a conscious death. She, she, she had a brain tumor and it was giving her stroke after stroke and it was going to slowly destroy her. And she said, finally, in July of 2015, honey, I'm done. It's time for me to go. The hardest experience I ever had was calling hospice and letting them manage her passing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but it was an, a remarkable experience. Still, well, well, I'll never forget it. When, when you, you when you were together, you were together did you, did you um, um, have psychic experiences uh, before this? Yeah, this is anything you'd ask. Most of them were really hilarious. Uh, but almost as soon as we got married, we lived in a little apartment on West Fifty Fifth Street in Manhattan. Uh, 347 West 55th Street, a back one bedroom little dinky apartment, you know, that in those days in 1969, it was $125 a month. Oh, God. <laughs> and, yeah, well, times have obviously changed, Oof. but uh, uh, it uh, uh, was, so we were living in this little place and it was like a little love nest. I mean, she fixed it up. It was a total dump, but she fixed it up and made it cute and beautiful and colorful and we were frankly just having a wonderful time together it was a glorious period and the best happiest time of my life until my first my child was born um and uh those experiences started almost immediately and they were weird and inexplicable but we were kids and we just laughed it off at one time the the stereo came to life and started conversing with me and it can't do that it doesn't have any it doesn't have the ability to do that it's not possible and it we talked back and forth for a moment and i finally i said who are you and the voice just was silent and i said are you still there or words to that effect it's been a long time but I'll never forget the last thing it said. It was a young male voice and it said, I know something else about you. And I said, what? What? And that was it. We never heard from it again. Yeah. <laughs> that, re that reminds me of, oh gosh, I can't remember the movie. It came out in the early 2000s and it was about a, a son and a father. The father... Um, it communicates through a radio um, by accident into the future to his son. And I, and I wonder if, if it was maybe a, a younger version of you or, or some other, like your, your subconscious speaking through to you. sound like me. No. And, but there's, there's actually more to the story. And, uh, at some point in that same period, I was walking out to take the trash to the, incinerator in those days in New York, 
you dropped your trash in your apartment down into the basement in, and it fell into an incinerator, if you can believe it. Um, it's, it's all different now, but it was like that then. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, the, the, I'm walking down the hall and it's a long hallway. There's a stairway right beside our apartment, a stairway in the middle and a stairway on the far end. And the stairways go all the way down eight floors to the to the to the ground floor. And I'm walking along and I can hear this funny noise below. A and it sounds like something sort of sliding sh 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 like that. Mm -hmm. And I think, what is that? And I put my garbage in and I can hear it still. So <laughs> I go down the far staircase to see what the hell the sound is. And what I see it, it coming down the hall looks like, and this is so weird, scary, and funny all at the same time. It looks like a corpse. It, its arms are spread. It's it has no lips. The teeth are just. It, it's like a like it's sort of rotted. Over, the area around its mouth is rotted away, and it's wearing nothing but a pair of briefs. And its legs are spread, and it's moving itself forward by thrusting its hips and sliding. And that's the sliding sound I heard. Uh -huh. When it sees me, it immediately speeds up. So I run back up the stairs and down the hall, and I can hear it going whoosh, 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 really fast. Yeah. I almost, and then it, I get in the apartment and slam the door. And in a certain a, a second later, there's this thud, thud against the door. Anne says, "What's going on?" I say, "I don't know." <laughs> and we How could you? Thing <laughs> uh, and then it turns out that the apartment immediately below us is all boarded up with plywood. And I called the landlord and I said, I described what happened. And it was a rent control building. And he says, you know, Mr. Strieber, I'm not going to be able to go down to rent control and ask for an eviction on the theory that one of my tenants is a living corpse. <laughs> and I, I said, I agree, but I just want you to know this is going on. He's got all of his windows boarded up and everything. And that was that. Well, you did, you did the right thing by reporting it, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were kids. We just yeah. blew it off. You know, I have, I have a question for you. So over the years with the, with the visitations, with these experiences, do you, where are you now as far as do they have a right to intrude on you? Um, because the, the way you describe them, um, and I've spoken about them over the years, there, there's almost, to, to my mind, I, I feel like there's almost this parental figure kind of relationship. Like they feel like they, have the right to do what they're doing. Is that fair? Well, the the first night I said you had no right, and they one of them did say we have a right. We do have a right. And do you believe and, that? Yeah, and, and, and this person, the individual on the cover of community, mm -hmm. took over my, our lives. I mean, she she became part of the family. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, our son once had a boy up to the cabin who had stuck his tongue in the light socket and had mm -hmm. a scar on his mouth as a result of having done this. She, no way, that was not going to be a friend. And so what happens is she shows up and she's projecting all kinds of imagery into my head, my mind designed to scare me away from this boy and then i see her and she's got smoke pouring out of her mouth and stuff and it's a but then the next morning the poor little boy is totally freaked out because although i was not aware of this he said mr streber um these long thin fingers kept coming around the door they had claws on them they would tap on the door and uh I would like to go home now. <laughs> and I said, okay. And we drove him home. We never saw him again. She made her point. Yeah. She didn't want that kid in our son's life. 
So, you know, but she, she became very much involved in the family and was for a long, long time. And then we lost the cabin and everything kind of fell apart. And they, the visitors still are still very actively present in my life, but not so much physically like that. Not, mm -hmm. not so much physically like that. She was almost at that point, like a combination of a, of a, of a, of a steward and a second wife. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I've written about what happened between us and Annie's uh, attitude when I told her that this individual had engaged me in a sexual encounter that I couldn't, I couldn't do anything about. Mm -hmm. She was totally cool with it. And interestingly enough, my dear friend, Jeffrey Kripal, uh, he's a very prominent scholar of comparative religion. At, and he's at Rice, and he's responsible for that archive I mentioned earlier, said, um, Whitley, I think that she's Anne, that, that it's all, it's the same entity, mm -hmm. that she's, that this is something to do with us. And that's why Anne didn't, didn't bother Anne, because Anne already knew it had happened, and it was simply part of life. And I think that what's happened in your marriage is that your your marriage has gone deeper into the unconscious that than most marriages do. And you know, with you combine that with Anne's discovery that the dead are involved in this, and you just have to think to yourself, we may not live in the world we think we live in. Our 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 uh 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 thought is these are aliens from another planet. You see UFOs flying around. Now the government's admitted that they're real and they don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. And that makes you think that surely this must be something um, from another planet. But And I think that's possible. But I think it's only part of it. Because whatever it is, in my experience, has no barrier between the living and the dead. They move freely across this boundary that is so absolute in our lives that most of us don't even believe we have an afterlife. I mean, we, we, we give it lip service, but we don't believe it. Sure, because we don't know it. Um, do you think that they are protectors or caretakers because in a sense, are they like, are we like their avatars? Um, is there that kind of relationship that's occurring? I would characterize this entity on the cover of communion as a teacher. Uh -huh. Okay. Very much so a teacher. And in fact, we got one letter where a woman wrote that she had seen one of these entities in her bedroom and she found herself blurting out teacher how wonderful to see you again. And uh, I had, I've tried many different methods of getting something on tape. And I have never succeeded with video. This house is full of videotape, video surveillance system. Mm -hmm. And what happens is I know the reason I know they, they, that there was something physical that could have been seen is that they will uh, turn off the cameras. <laughs> you know, in the, the, you know, you'll see the night's movements and stuff. It's a nest system and it, it will text you whenever there's movement and mm -hmm. so forth. And you see all, you look at, through a night of movement and then suddenly it says cameras offline, camera offline, camera offline. And then they start again on their own a few, a few minutes later. Yeah. And I know that was when they were in there and they could have been seen. It's very frustrating. But I did get one thing. I tried a little sleep app that it, it, that it gives you uh, a, um, it, you, you turn it on and it records sounds that it picks up during the night. Huh, okay. And it, it worked for a week or so. And in the sense that I did get 
remarkable things. I could, for example, one night I get this sounds of movement in the room, like somebody's coming into the room. And then you hear my sleep thickened voice say, who is that? And then I proceed to say, oh, mature. And uh, uh, and then in a very calm, collected voice with a lot of pleasure and happiness in it, you see, hear me say, teach me mature, like that. <laughs> and I think it was her. And I think that she is somehow or another, I see her as a mature being. Well, who then? Is she, uh, if Anne is connected to her in, in some way? Here's my best theory. I have a friend, Mark Sims, who's had close encounters and he's pretty well off. And as a result, he's got a lot collection of a lot of wonderful things such as uh, ancient Mesoamerican artifacts and things. And one of those artifacts is a, and even if it's a, not ancient. It's, this is still the work of some kind of a master. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see a being with great big black eyes sitting and holding in his, its arms, cradled in its arms, is a man, a human being. And there's a little sort of opening between the two of them. And the statuette cannot be, uh, cannot be balanced it will not stay balanced unless a tiny little triangle is put in that hole this little triangle that is part of it is put in mm -hmm. the hole and when that happens the statue remains in balance and i think what you're seeing is a soul that is conducting a body through life we are the bodies that these souls are conducting through life Okay. And the, 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 the balance, the, the little triangle is, is that says that the, the relationship is in balance when there's harmony between the two. And my whole life has been about building that harmony with what I would, we call the higher self or the soul or mm -hmm. the ancient Egyptians, uh, uh, called it, the. Uh, I think I always get mixed up, whether it was the car or the bar, but it's one of the two. Now, I have been shown at one point a whole bunch of portraits of myself. And it, it, not of this Whitley, but of a lot of Whitleys, all of whom had a vaguely similar look to them. And I think they were past lives. I, I think I've had a lot of lives, or that there have been a lot of lives lived by this soul. And I'm one of them, I'm the most recent one, apparently. So then, is it possible, can we entertain the, the thought that these visitors are kind of like the hired help, like our higher selves need intervention at, at times? Well, I think that, in a sense, we are our own visitors. Uh, uh, okay. And um, well, I like, there's a hint of this in uh, and secretary Lori Barnes was, um, had an experience in 19, in the early fifties, she was lying in bed in Queens and her husband was a pianist and out on a gig. She was pregnant and suddenly she noticed movement and she looked up and there was this long line of these dark blue troll like figures uh standing in line beside her bed and she recoiled of course and the one in the front said do not be afraid we're not here for you we are here because we are interested in the girl child you're carrying which na naturally helped and then she was, wasn't afraid anymore <laughs> very much the opposite right. but then when she continued to panic he put his hand on the back, fingers on the back of her hand and his glove, dark blue gloved fingers on the back of her hand and said, mm -hmm. my dear, why do you fear us? 
And he, he, she said, because you're so ugly. And they were quite horrible looking. And he then said, one day you will look just like us. Does that mean the human species has more than one form? That's not unknown in nature at all. There's lots of species yeah. with more than one form. Of course, these are insectoid-ish kind of beings. So what does that mean for the future? Well, those dark blue ones are more like trolls. They don't look like insects at oh, all. Oh, yes, good point. My apologies, uh, right. I'll tell you yeah. another story about them that suggests... Wow. Hmm. Uh, God, I've, I've had a very strange life. I, I, I started out, I'm, I'm so conservative and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not a wild man. Let me put it this way. I'm laughably uh, conservative. And I'm not politically conservative. I'm politically moderate. I'm too conservative to be a conservative as, as that is defined now. <laughs> so anyway, sure. you know, I'm very, I'm very much into nothing over much. One of the great admonitions from the Oracle at Delphi. Mm -hmm. So um, I was really the last person that you could imagine getting involved in this. But here's the other story. Uh, this is back again before anything any of the, before the communion experience back in the early 70s when we were living on 55th street in manhattan annie and i are walking home from the bookstore there used to be bookstores all up and down fifth avenue in those glorious dead days um we were walking home from our uh, a weekly trek to the bookstores which we did every week and it was night and but just between uh, broadway and eighth just just off of eighth avenue uh there's a there was a little storefront a sort of dark dinky kind of st street mm -hmm. and there's this little storefront that had no it had a bay window but no signs or anything in it and there was it would there would be a curtain hanging in it, and there was often a chair there and every once in a while you would see a girl sitting in the chair with her legs crossed and her skirt up and um we used to laughingly call it the whore store <laughs> You know, we figured they must be wars. I mean, that must be what's going on. So this, especially night, at, especially, especially at that time, time and that, that would not be surprising, not surprising, right? Oh, right, exactly, yeah, not yeah, at all. Yeah. And so, this night though, something's going on in the horse store, big time. The chairs lying on its side, the curtains flying back and forth. Remember, we've never seen anything like the visitors or anything like that. This is before the Laurie Barnes story came into our life, before any of that, before my community experience, anything. And these dark blue dwarfs are running out and back and forth from behind the curtain. And there's a guy, you can see there's a guy in a business suit trying to get out. And they're pushing him back and grabbing him and he's trying to get out and the curtain's flying. We watched this for a second and Annie says, let's keep going because it was pretty scary. We did not know what to make of what we were seeing. Sure, sure, sure. So we go back to the house and we're having an attack of conscience. I say, honey, we need to call the cops for that guy. Something's going on. He's getting mugged. And we start to call the police. And then I realize she realizes, Whitley, we're going to call the police and tell them we're seeing a man being mugged by little blue dwarfs. They're going to come here, not there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We didn't. Yeah. So we didn't call the cops. And we you'll, just, you'll be taking a trip instead. instead. Right. Right. We just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. But here's another story. This is this is about them also. Let's do this a little bit. I never do this. You know, you got me off on this track. So go let's just yeah. go ahead and down this road a little bit because it's a road nobody expects anyone to go down. All right. I had a friend who was a psychologist. And he had one spectacularly bizarre experience in his life. He's living in Queens. He's driving along the Grand Central Parkway, which goes beside LaGuardia Airport. It's night, the parkway's packed, it's traffic. He's heading out to Long Island, where he lived actually, mm -hmm. way, way out. And, um, he notices suddenly what looks like a gigantic plane coming down toward 
him and landing. It looks like it's going to land on the highway instead of the runway. And of course, he's terrified. But then it, as it passes over, he said, it was the strangest thing. It looked like a fake airplane. Then his eyes move down and he sees uh, what looks like a new one of those old fashioned news signs made of made of lots of bulbs that they used to have like circling Times square and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this sign on the roadside and these strange symbols are flying across it. And then he sees there are parked cars. And there are people standing in a circle and people getting out of the cars and going to this circle. And he decides, I want to see what's the world is going on here because I've never experienced anything like this in my life before. So he stops and get out, gets out of his car and he's walking toward these people to try to ask them what is going on. And then he can see the sign. The symbols make no sense to him whatsoever. And suddenly this little man, he didn't say he was blue, but he was just a little dwarf, like small, stocky man walks up to him and says in this tough voice, get out of here. And that scared him badly. And he got back in his car and went home. And you see, these things are interacting with us in ways that we don't understand. And are these part of the human species that perhaps controls the journey of souls between life and death or something like that? Who are yeah. we is the biggest question of all, because we don't know. We don't know yeah. that these in in entities are aliens. We don't know what they are. We do know that UFOs have propulsion that is almost we're close to understanding. And I have a feeling maybe we have some we have some serious understanding of it that's still hidden and hopefully won't be forever. Sure, I think so too. But why is it like this? Why could I even ask questions like this? Right, yeah. Wow. It's it's almost like if you can ask it, there's a reason that you you can ask it. Now, because th if you're real careful with this mm -hmm. and don't make any assumptions, all of these questions come to life in a new way. Anne used to say, the human species is too young for beliefs. What we need are good questions. Right. And and should we live by the questions and not get so hung up on the answers? Absolutely. That is essential. Otherwise, we will never find this out because we're not looking for them. We are looking for our place in this phenomenon and mm. what that means. And that we can probably determine, but I'm not so sure we will ever nail them down. You, you know, know, I see all of these things of all these alien species. Mm -hmm. People have to, this species and that species and the other species and they're from this planet and that planet. And that's all a bridge too far as far as I'm concerned. I know there is something strange happening. I know I have an implant in my left ear that I use all the time in my work. I know who put it in. It wasn't aliens. It was two people. I know all of these things. But what I don't know is what the end of this mysterious journey is. Right. And that it, that's the, what I love the most, though. That's in my personal life. When I was younger, I was banging my head up against the wall, needing to know the answer. And, I, and with age, I've come much more comfortable with sort of living in that liminal space of not knowing. Yes. Um, and, and somehow that that feels like kind of like an answer unto itself. I know that sounds abstract, but um, for, for you, what do you do to, to find the, the divine, if, if, if that's a word you're comfortable with um, within yeah, yourself? I am comfortable with it. Well, this has been a huge journey. It's a huge, especially after Annie passed away, uh, because she came back in many different ways. And not only that, I saw her after she died. At, as she was dying, I saw her ascend into this, 
incredible blueness that I just the loveliest color I've ever seen in my life. So the divine is very important to me. And, and I also discovered that in having a relationship with the visitors, mine started out real rough. I mean, it's, I, there's no other way to describe sure. it. Yeah. Real rough. And, but I made it better in doing two things. One is I went for it. When I realized they were real mm-hmm. in some way, I started going out in the woods in the middle of the night to signal my willingness to try harder. And that was not easy. But try, it, try, I'm sorry, Whitley, try harder to do what? Try harder to, to have a relationship with them. Okay. I was saying, yes, I'm here. I know uh, it, was, it was pretty noisy the first time, but I'm here and I want to keep trying. Okay. And they took me up on it and they did. And as I said, she became, this entity became part of our life for a long time, months, six months or so. And more than that, there was much more. And it got easier. Yeah. But I discovered something about them that's absolutely fascinating. They're very reflective. In other words, they will they they reflect you. If you are afraid, they they will react the same way. I'll give you an example. Situation at our cabin. Uh, there's Raven Dana. Uh, one of the experiences is in one bedroom. Laurie Barnes and another later in another bedroom. Uh, my son and I are camping out in the woods. A filmmaker is in on the couch in the living room. And he his, he and his wife on the convertible couch. And there is a low light camera pointing down the hall uh, that leads to the bedrooms from the living room. He wakes up in the night and he sees a little man with black eyes, round black eyes and a huge head peering over the peering at down at him from beside the bed. Of course, it scares the living daylights out of him because he's a Hollywood documentary filmmaker. He's not into this. He's He's been hired by whoever hired him. And um, he reacts immediately with terror because this is the last thing in the world he expects to see. And the next thing you know, it immediately responds by turning into the head of a hawk. Hmm. In other words, it was like a blowfish. He was frightened and it became threatening yes. because it was yes. trying to ward him off out mm-hmm. of fear he, it would be attacked. Well, you mentioned that the these other beings are, are afraid or maybe afraid of humans, right? Well, when you when all is said and done, a lot of them that I've glimpsed, I wish I could say I've seen, but I've glimpsed is the only way to describe it, are very small. And especially some of the ones that people call the grays are very small and fragile. Uh, but, but you know, I think they, they probably value their lives too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I could, I could backhand one of them and break them into 10 pieces. So, you know, here they are face to face with these gigantic, more than slightly crazy, uh, very violent apes, and, and, yeah. and they're yeah. little fragile things that maybe came from the insect world or whatever they, they came from. Sure. And so of course they're going to be really careful with us. That that's how I would feel around a silverback gorilla. I mean, yeah, or, sure. or more likely a tiger, a tiger because right. you know a tiger is very dangerous and you cannot tell what he's thinking. Yes, a silverback. You know his habits, and um, unless he's going to start threatening you, mm-hmm. but we're like the tiger will will unexpectedly blow up. Yes. But this set me on a journey. This realization that they're reflective, and it's been a long journey. How do I ref- how do I live in such a way that I reflect back something that causes them to feel confident? and to treat me with gentleness and open yeah. to me as much as possible the wonderful store of knowledge that's there. And I came to, uh, Annie was a great student of Jesus. And so I came to this idea that 
the teachings of Jesus give you a real understanding of how to live in the good and for the good. Mm -hmm. But it's all been kind of kind of uh, co-opted by religious doctrine. And I don't necessarily want to believe religious doctrine. I don't want to be uh, Catholic or Christian. I grew up a Catholic. And I, I don't want to necessarily say that the creed, the Nicene Creed, is the truth, the revealed truth of God. But the teaching is there. Yes. So I wrote a book called Jesus, A New Vision, which is the latest book, which is for people who are basically secular and don't, don't want to be in religion, to give them an understanding of the Jesus teaching and also of why the religion came about in about the third century AD, because it, it would, did not start with Jesus. It, it started later and it was then it was codified and made into part of Roman law exactly. by Constantine. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was made into a God. Well, last week's guest, Jim Willis, he and I were talking about the lost gospels, Gnostic gospels, and this this whole topic. And there there is a, a divine presence, if you will, but it's not restricted to uh, those four gospels as codified by the church. That that there is more out there, and there are other oh, writings. Yeah. yeah, it's it's beautiful. We only have a few minutes. I have to ask you: um, when I was a child my animal self-ascribed animal spirit was a wolf and you know i used to pretend to be a wolf and, and jump around and i and i wonder what about you because the wolf is so central to much of your work well i'm sorry to say that i wish my animal spirit was something cool like a wolf my animal <laughs> well, spirit I, is a dog okay, and i'll yeah. tell you a story about this dog specific dog i was meditating one afternoon in the living room, Annie was still very much alive. And suddenly I saw in my mind's eye, just as clear as almost on the television screen, shambling up was a dog I had known when I was a boy, a teenager. Yeah. His name was Quagmire. And Quag was a big <laughs> shaggy dog, always dirty and muddy. And he had a hard life because the father in that family had come back from the Korean War with what we now know as PTSD. And he used to be beat up Quagmire all the time. But Quagmire didn't care. Quagmire was always happy. He was always happy. He was yeah. always gentle. He always had a smile on his face and he was always glad to see you. And I told Ann about this and she said, dog God, you just had a visit from God. And I said, Quagmire, no, uh, yeah. you I, I, I have to have a sign in order to believe that. And so about half an hour later, we go on our afternoon walk. And as soon as we reach the street corner, they're parked on the, on the street is a car with a vanity plate, Q-G-M-I-R-E, Quagmire. Perfect. And I thought, okay, thank you, God. And now I, I, I kind of understand something that I didn't understand before. So that's why I'm, I consider my spirit animal to be the dog. That That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Whitney. Uh, Whitley. Um, one last question. In your work, uh, the global, coming global superstorm, uh, you explore climate change. And so what what do you see that's happening right right now? How, how, how does Whitley Strieber uh, it, describe this? In, I, in a way, I wish you hadn't asked this question because it's over. The climate is going to change. And it is going to change in ways that are very, very negative to the continued large amount of human life on the planet and as it is being lived now. It will not be the same. Uh, and it, we, we're going to see a very rapid melt of the North, very much more rapid than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. Back when I wrote Superstorm with Art, Art Bell, a beloved friend, deceased now, uh, they gave uh, Al Gore the Pulitzer Prize for basically saying that climate change is real, but it's going to happen slowly. We have time. We haven't had time for a long time. The visitors started me with climate change back in the 80s. Yeah. And... Uh, 
we should have done something then, but the Reagan administration interrupted that process by saying climate change wasn't real. And that became a politic, it became, it was politicized and the United States was frozen. We d both didn't do much of anything about it domestically. And we didn't above all show the kind of international leadership that we can show uh, to guide the world into a better state. And now it's too late. It is not going to, it, it, it is too late to change it. We will see the full effects of climate change. And this will consist of very rapid heating. I mean, it's pretty much all in Superstorm, uh, it, a very rapid heating, yeah. uh, followed by a tremendous decline in the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted because of the fact that the human population will be smaller and it will be much less active. Um, and uh, then the methane that is now outgassing from the Ar Arctic will dissipate and there'll be a tremendous upheaval in 50 or 100 years, yeah. which will climax the process of climate change. But between then and now, we're going to really suffer. Okay. If you would like to get the Superstorm communion and other works, go to unknowncountry.com. Whitley, if you could leave us with one uplifting thought. Uh, what yeah, would it be? That's why I w didn't want you to ask that question. I, I, <laughs> okay. There is an uplifting thought that is my life. In the Gospel of Mary, which is one of the apocryphal Gospels you alluded to a moment ago, God is not called God. God is called the good. Hmm. There's no point in waiting for the visitors to take us off the planet at the last minute. The Calvary is not coming. That's not what this is about, and it never has been. Live for the good. Yes. Live for the good completely. I asked Annie after she died what enlightenment is. And she said, enlightenment is what happens when there's nothing left of us but love. You live for that. And no matter what happens to you in these tumultuous times, yeah. you will be cherished. That's beautiful, really. I, I, I feel you when you talk about that love, because my wife and I have been through from very rough times. And um, I know that deep well, um, and it resonates with me very strongly. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Whitley Strieber. Welcome back to Power Normal Now, every Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, live on KGRADB.com and on YouTube, on Facebook. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Power Normal underscore now for show updates and on Instagram at Power Normal Now. Uh, joining me in just a moment is Rebecca Hardcastle, right? She is a leading expert in exoconsciousness and the extraterrestrial presence. She is committed to building an exoconscious civilization co-created by humans, ETs, and multi-dimensional beings. Ken Cherry is the author of Mark Slade Investigates, the Stephenville UFO, the founder of Epic Extraordinary Phenomena Investigation Council, and Epic Voyages Radio. He is a fifth-generation Texan and a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He was the state director of MUFON Mutual UFO Network over 10 years. Welcome back, Rebecca and Ken Cherry. Happy Hi. to be here. Hey, thanks Hi, Ken. So much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Rebecca. This is going to be, I think, a very interesting roundtable. <laughs> so I'll start with Rebecca. Um, I, I'm assuming you are 
you have your own particular perspective on the UAP task force and disclosure in general, because you do come at it from this exoconscious perspective that, that there is a sort of agenda, um, not necessarily here on earth, but, but elsewhere. Uh, so could you give us your kind of overview of, of what, what's going on here? My feelings, I, 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 I just want to say how much I enjoyed Whitley and what he had to say. And your um, one of your last questions, you asked him about the Superstorm book that he wrote with Art mm -hmm. Bell. I would say that we have a coming consciousness Superstorm right now. And we humans are unaware of its ramifications and what exactly is going to happen during that storm. And that's what I've dedicated the last five years of my life investigating so for me, working with Dr. Edgar Mitchell and Quantrack and working with um, alternative zero point energy types of technology, when I look at what's happening with UAP and government disclosure, exopolitics, I just wanna add just kind of parenthetically two things. Number one, I've been a childhood experiencer since um, forever, since three years old, my conscious memory. So this mm -hmm. has always been an aspect of my life, a relationship of my life. It certainly it intensified during my adulthood. But um, also just working with Dr. Mitchell and knowing so, kind of the ins and outs of some of the technology, why it wasn't moved forward, what happened. So that's, that's where I come from this. And I see the UAP disclosure and I've been involved with exopolitics for over 20 years with Steve Bassett, mm -hmm. um, Alfred Weber, I was active with them. So I see what's happening today as the United States government and intelligence community and primarily the military will begin to unfold advanced energy technology, not only for space travel, but also to generate power here on Earth in a brand new way. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a French fusion reactor um, is coming online soon, and it has a magnet that is 280,000 times stronger than the Earth's own magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So if you couple that with things that are happening on Earth with CERN or weather modification, um, that's what we're going to have being um, revealed to humans as well as a lot of metamaterials. Um, is that is that a positive or a negative? Well, I have some concerns, and I actually wrote my book, Exoconscious Humans Will Free Will Survive in a Non-Human World, because I asked the question, um, I like how you and Whitley were talking about questions. I asked the question, is psychic intelligence possible in a transhuman or non-human world? And I dug in and examined biologically consciousness um, mm -hmm. aspects all through um, the whole geoengineering of the earth, what that would mean for consciousness. So uh, what I tried to do was to reach some common grounds. But my biggest concerns, I would say, are um, the occupation and the depletion of many, many minerals here on earth, because even though tech is seen as green, it's actually extremely resource depleting on this earth, uh, especially in terms of raw minerals and rare minerals. So we're going to have to go out into space to find those minerals to make the tech possible. Right. I think you're right. A lot of people don't understand to they, build, build the physical tech itself requires right. going into the earth, tearing up. Yes. Yeah. And, and we've almost depleted what we need to build the tech out. There's a wonderful book out called um, Atlas AI by a woman named Kate Crawford. And she goes into all the details of what's actually happening to Earth and why we have to go to asteroids and the moon and other planets to find these rare Earth minerals, because we can't sustain this technology here on Earth. So we will become ETs literally to other planets. So there's a lot of terraforming going on, not just of our planet. For example, um, I don't know if you noticed in the news narrative, it's talking about the moon wobbles causing a lot of flooding. I don't know if you picked that up. It I came out just this one. week. I'm like, ah, oh, moon wobble. Well, of course, that couldn't have to do with the French fusion reactor or CERN or, oh, interesting. you know, we're wobbling our own planet, literally. And then the news is saying, hmm. oh, no, 
it's it's the moon that's wobbling, causing all these floods. Um, I'm very concerned about um, engineering, genetically engineering humans and what that's going to be, how that's going to happen, because sure. genetic engineering of humans involves mind control. And this has been a topic of um, extraterrestrial experience for extra, extra, extraterrestrial experiencers, as well as ufologists for a long time. And many of us studied in depth for decades, mind control, and yet we're all just comfortably moving into this era of genetic engineering mm -hmm. being placed in our body and not even asking what it is. So in my book, I actually go into, here's the background of genetic engineering. Here's, here's how it happens. Sure. Um, I think that there's a lot of technocratic totalitarianism that's going to go along with that with um, advanced AI systems going into our planet. And because that's how they work, they, they're a closed system. And that was probably my biggest aha moment was that when I realized that I, as an ET experiencer, freely go out into the field of consciousness. So I go out and connect, communicate and co-create with extraterrestrials and multidimensionals. That is a natural thing to me. Other people talk about they go out into the field of consciousness, as Whitley was talking about, speaking with Anne or mm -hmm. relating to God. That's that's part of this free will freedom that humans have had for eons here on Earth. Sure, had there's been control through religion and government and education, but by and large, the individual human could break those bonds of earth and go sure. out into the field of consciousness. So what we're seeing with transhumanism and AI is that they are literally building a closed loop system. They are building a field of consciousness for humans to live in. A, a, almost like a cage. Well, they don't perceive it as a cage. They perceive it as a better life. And that's what I went into in my book. I, I tried to understand what's, what's the perception that would drive someone to do this or want mm -hmm. to create this field. And what it does is it makes engineering and science easier to do because no one is, there's no hacker coming in from the outside and questioning you. Right. All right. Let's, let's let Ken jump in here. Ken, how are you? Uh, good. Thank you. Um, I come at this from a slightly different angle from Rebecca. You might mm -hmm. not surprise you. I'm also an experiencer. When I was a very young man, uh, you know, I had a very dramatic UFO experience where I saw uh, a jet trying to force down a UFO and uh, the jet lost. The pilot ended up uh, bailing out and, uh, you know, getting hung up in the trees out in the countryside where we lived and the, and the jet crashed. But after that, I began to, ha there was a reason, obviously, apparently, that the UFO was there because uh, I began to have these uh, uh, experiences where, you know, I was taken on board a ship and so forth as a, as a young boy. Mm -hmm. And at first, I really fought it. I mean, it was very frightening, um, night terrors and that sort of thing. So, uh, but I did come to peace with it after a time. And then the influence of my life became benevolent. They had a positive influence on my health, my marriage. Um, my youngest daughter uh, uh, survived uh, from being aborted when my wife was having false labor. Uh, they just appeared and calmed her, my wife, while she was about to abort the baby. So, you know, I think in listening to Whitley, and I was, I'm blessed to have known Whitley and Ann. As a matter of fact, we were discussing my book, and Ann was enthusiastic about it the week before she passed. She was still just as bright as possible she could possibly be, and she was just gleeful about some of the things that we were discussing in there. And some of the things that I revealed in my book and in my investigation were just uh, astounding. I mean, the uh what i focused on was what do we have 
and why isn't it being bought forth? And what I found out through various um, high level government uh, people uh, from various agencies who contacted me and said, look, we can't go public, but here's something you need to know. Um, that uh, there are basically three different forces involved in this disclosure. Uh, one is, are the people who want to maintain the control of the technology and those that don't want to, I mean, they want to go full scale public, you know, get it all out there and let the, everyone benefit from it. And the others, and the others are the non-human intelligences, many of them who live among us here on earth and always have, which we've shared the planet with them and they were advanced long before we got here. And I think we could probably get into a long discussion and how much they've influenced human civilization over, you know, our entire <laughs> existence here. But um, I, one of the sources came to me after Stephenville in January of 2008, about uh, February, they said there's going to be a UN meeting because everybody is so up in arms about the, what's going on with Stephenville that they're calling a, a meeting of uh, some of the top people from the uh, seven major countries around the world who have um, these uh, uh, par partition groups that know all about UFOs and technology, the ET technology we have and so forth. But they basically, uh, you know, they clued me in on what was discussed there. And one of the things is that they were given an ultimatum by the others to look, you have to start preparing your people for disclosure because if you don't, we're going to force it. We're, we're, you know, unhappy with your pace of disclosure, basically. So, uh, obviously, their time frame is much longer than ours, but I, I see this report coming out when it did as being the very minimum that was necessary to uh, fulfill that you know next step toward disclosure. Because what we have here is finally a government entity in terms of the American intelligence community admitting that UFOs, UAPs exist. And we had, the government itself had never taken a position before. Yeah. Uh, if anything, they spent a lot of energy trying to, uh, you know, poo-poo them and so forth. And uh, anybody who came forward was ridiculed. So this puts... Uh, the subject in the category of a, uh, you know, something that's a legitimate conversation for people in power. And it's asking everybody now in the military to come forward, whereas before they were ridiculed, to report it. And of course, what they use to legitimize it is that it's a threat, you know, that there's this ongoing threat. So it's not that these are ETs or anything like that. It's a phenomenon that we don't understand, and it's a threat. And they use that over and over in their report, uh, that language of it being a threat. So uh, to me, I mean, that's, that's the minimum requirement that they had to satisfy the, the need to, to come forward with some sort of disclosure. Uh, full disclosure, uh, even within the report, they admit that of the categories of uh, uh, things that these could be, is it could be our own technology that the uh, in, uh, intelligence agencies are not aware of. <laughs> so, you know, they don't, so anybody that thought that we were going to find out uh, any secrets uh, about this ad advanced technology is just mistaken. I, I remember um, Ben Rich's quote, who is the uh, CEO of Skunk Works that, uh, uh, of Lockheed that built a lot of these secret projects for the government. Obviously, they were involved in the most secret projects of all. And he said, uh, you know, we already possess the means to take ET to travel to the stars. 
And, uh, you know, it wouldn't take light years like uh, Einstein thought. He said, but it would even, what was it? Uh, anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. And it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. So, you know, the things that they have, that we have, that we possess, that we have uh, produced in cooperation with these other intelligences, uh, there's a bloody battle that has gone on behind the scenes to keep this stuff a secret. And uh, I think before the they're ever rolled out in public, mm -hmm. that we're going to begin to see UAPs, uh, UFOs, flying saucers, call them what you will, more and more frequently and blatantly uh, in broad daylight over major cities where the, if eventually it becomes undeniable. Uh, Rebecca, do you think, do you agree with that assessment? That they will make themselves known physically and we'll, we'll see more and more? I think we're going to see a lot of our own technology being revealed. Yeah, like we'll, be, of, yeah. we'll be forced to reveal. Because yeah. what, ha what is happening right. now is that people are picking up these UAPs and UFOs, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. so frequently that uh, the government will be, they can't uh, allow this to become part of the fear of uh, people. And so they, they're going to have to say, well, we have the means to defend ourselves from this the phenomena, whatever it is. Okay. That, that was actually put together in um, in NATO when when Biden was over in Europe just recently. Um, Article five in NATO, they put together that the NATO countries, which do not include um, China or Russia, that they would defend each other um, in an Earth to space attack, uh, a space to Earth attack, and space platform to sp space platform attack. So they already have you know, come out very publicly in terms of what they, what they plan to do. When, when I first, yeah, when I first read this report and I kept coming across the threatening tone of what they had to say, it reminded me of uh, Ronald Reagan's speech before the UN talking about the alien threat that would unite the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course, that was effective in getting him the SDI program, the Star Wars. And I've talked to scientists who said that the Star Wars was really quite successful and that we did develop uh, space-based weapons and weapons that some of these so-called crashes that take place are not actually crashes of, uh, you know, intelligent beings that could travel traverse the galaxy they're actually shot down as they come into the atmosphere they're considered to be some who are considered to be uh, hostile so you know this this cry of uh, alien threat and getting more money to study it and for more data and for more toys has been going on forever as a matter of fact uh, general MacArthur uh, I had a friend who was uh, someone quite close to me who was in the OSS during World War II and was an aide to General MacArthur. Uh, the OSS was the predecessor of the CIA. Anyway, they went to several crash sites of uh, ships that were either accidentally shot down or knocked down during bad weather. And they said they viewed actual alien bodies there. So. After the war, uh, MacArthur gave a speech to a uh, graduating West Point class saying, in the future, we'll be fighting, you know, with people from other mm -hmm. planets. And then he gave uh, later uh, an interview to a, a leading magazine of the day stating the same thing. So, you know, this this report is just an echo from the past as far as I'm concerned. It's just, sure. it, it always reeked to me of uh, money, <laughs> fishing for money. So Money, money. Money, 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 money. Right. And then where does that money go? No, the, the, well, those, I, I, those who are running the report, do how do they not know 
whether it's our craft or not, right? So that, that seems a bit they odd don't, to me. Yeah. They don't. Uh, as I was saying, Ben Rich's quote, these, these programs are so deeply embedded in the uh, uh, black uh, that n very, very few people know them. I'll give you a, a quick story. A good friend of mine was a, uh, she was a, had a, graduated with a master's degree and she was approached by the CIA and they offered to pay for her PhD and would have a great job at Bell Labs long ago. And she was a scientist. Anyway, her one of her first jobs was to go, they gave her the coordinates to go to this uh, particular place and just report back. That's all. Don't do anything. Just be, you know, clandestine, report back. And she said at the time, she's sitting there and uh, this triangular craft came down and hovered just a few feet above a mesa. And suddenly these men appeared with a cart that came, you know, kind of serviced this thing. Mm -hmm. And then it took off quietly, silently. This is a black triangular anti-grav craft. And she said, this was the mid seventies. Mm -hmm. Now what had happened was that the Robertson report in 52, the CIA said, everybody turn over everything you have to do with UFOs and uh, alien technology. And of course, that just made everybody dig in their heels. And she said, what happened was they ended up spying on each other to find out, you know, what the Air Force had, what the CIA, what other, you know, uh, Area 51, whatever was doing. So, yeah, one hand doesn't know what the other is doing, even to this day. Is there is there a timeline, uh, do you think, Rebecca, um, within within our lifetime that, that we're going to see a real revelation, not just a, um, in a nine page report? Well, I think one big timeline was um, given just recently by Julie Sweet, who's the CEO of Accenture. It's a, it's a, it's a con big consulting firm. It's part of the World Economic Forum. It's part of, it's part of um, Bill Gates' um, ID2020 group. And she came up recently just in terms of our technology that we're gonna be releasing. And she said that their view into the future, and, and, the, and these consultants run a lot of what I go into my book called art, artificial intuition. So they're running um, these scenarios with algorithms and AI to predict what's going to happen. And so they've got a pretty good idea of what the timeline is. And she said that the timeline was um, for to have, you know, everything to sort of be under control, okay? was going to be 2030. But then when she said with COVID, we've actually um, dropped that timeline back and now 2025 is our timeline. So I would say in about, you know, three and a half, four years, um, by that time, a lot of um, our technology is going to be revealed and we are going to be living in a, in a very different consciousness at that point. And what, what, what do you describe as this different consciousness? Um, this consciousness will be, um, you know, Kim was talking about things being decentralized, decentralized. I really think everything is centralized. I think that the, um, the, the central bank has a digital currency that's going to be rolling out. So we're not going to spend money independently the way that we have in the past because we have right. the capability to totally centralize it. Um, but we're will, going will to be, affect, will it affect us individually, but like literally our consciousness in some oh, way? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. We're talking about, um, massively sophisticated in, uh, mental entrainment technologies. Um, we're talking about, um, I mean, Elon Musk and different types of neural networks that are going into the human brain. I, I don't know if you saw the BBC, they had a, they had a little quip of a girl and she's in a hospital bed and she's talking to her mother and her father and they're upset that she had the surgery and she's blinking her eyes and her, her mind is a cell phone. So she's taking their picture like oh that God. by blinking their eyes. Mm -hmm. She's reading what's in their minds with her mind. So they are connected with her. Just like remember when the doorbell thing, the door ring came out, with Amazon and they said to make sure everybody's okay, we're going to connect your house to everybody else's house in your neighborhood. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. So now yeah. we're talking about that was just 
on a macro level, on a micro level, my mind is going to be hooked to Ken's and to Alan's. And so, so there's going to be this, um, we're going to be a resource, an aspect of an, an, an artificial field of consciousness. Well, as much as I like you two, um, I think I'll pass in the early. <laughs> right, so, right. So yeah. I just, I, I just want to say that what we're yeah. doing as we came to the realization, and it took me five years to write my book because mm -hmm. I was living in D.C. at the time, and I just kept stumbling upon information and just being guided. I mean, one of the things that happened was um, I moved from Northern Virginia over to Maryland, and I ended up living in this apartment complex called Avalon. And I lived right across the street from um, Craig Ventner's Genome Project. <laughs> I mean, what are the chances of that happening? And there was just incident after incident when I would bump into people in D.C. and find out more and more knowledge about what was technologically, what was unfolding within our government and our culture mm -hmm. and our science and our, and our engineering. And so when I came back to Phoenix, I live in Phoenix now, I, I founded the uh, Institute for Exoconsciousness. Because we feel that we are, as experiencers, that we are valuing and prioritizing the natural human consciousness ability to go out into the field and to co-create with these extraterrestrials and multidimensionals or those who have passed over or God, however, however you want to explain this field of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So our, our goal is that we've, we, that's a big that's a big goal, right? That's a big vision. That's a very so, big vision. Okay. Yes. So the way that we narrowed that down was we said that we're here to increase the business success of psychically inspired entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs who are experiencers, mm -hmm. who want to bring in technology that is related to the field of consciousness. So we're creating a, a different highway. For you're, humans. You're, yeah, you're counterbalancing or yes. I, yes. I don't, maybe it's not the best word to use, but it sounds a little bit like a resistance to to that. Or it's I an know option, alternative. Or an, op or an option, right. I, I, would, I would never implant a Neuralink in my brain. Like You <laughs> wouldn't, but many people will. And, and many people have already contemplated that. And I, I guarantee when Elon Musk Neuralink goes, goes viral, Mm -hmm. And the propaganda rolls out. People will be lined up around the block to do that. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we have to do that. But no yeah. one is talking about or creating an option that we can have as extraterrestrial experiencers. I call us exoconscious experiencers because that natural field of consciousness is not only us, but it is mm -hmm. also this planet and nature. So okay, we want to be in resonance with nature. We're going to open up the phone lines. So if you want to call in and ask your questions of Ken and Rebecca, the number is 85-KGRA-LIVE or 855-472-5483. Ken, you were going to jump in there. Well, I was going to agree uh, with the proposition that people will adapt the neural link and for no other reason than competitiveness. Because, you know, if you are sitting in a business meeting and your mind can immediately access a piece of information that's helpful to you. Believe me, I've been in uh, some high level uh, company meetings where it gets very competitive and there are people looking for any edge they can get. I worked on wall street among some of the lions of the, uh, this uh, economy uh, and country. And I'm telling you, they would, they'd probably adapt, it, adopt that thing in a heartbeat just just for the edge it would give them. Well, you know, uh, I will say, I think is a good parallel just from my own personal experience. When Instagram first came out, I enjoyed Instagram. It, it was just a linear stroll, a scroll. You posted an image and it went up the feed and that was it. And you found people you like, people found you. It was fun. Then Facebook took it over. <laughs> and now the fun, you know, I still enjoy it a little bit, but now it feels like an obligation. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like they're, 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 I, I literally feel the manipulation 
of their algorithms. Um, and I and I resent that and I'm really upset about that, but I still continue to use it because I know to be relevant, you still have to some degree be on, on social media, Facebook, whatever it is. Um, is there any hope for us? Is there is there a way out of this? I think we have to create our own hope. We we have to get proactive and that's why we founded the Institute because we felt like if we don't start doing something, we're going to lose our, lose our psychic intelligence. And I personally am not willing to do that. And uh, as, as Ken said, um, or Whitley, one of them said, you know, they're not going to come down and save us. This is really no. a crossroads <laughs> in human development. Humans are either going to become exoconscious humans and take responsibility for accessing that field of many diverse extraterrestrials or they're going to default to a transhuman agenda and lose that ability. I personally am not willing to do that, nor do I want it for my children and my grandchildren. We're, we're headed uh, like a train wreck toward transhumanism mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. one of the things that you kind of touched on earlier was the digital currency that is coming. Mm -hmm. And it's going to change our whole lives in ways that people don't even understand in, in the least. Once they do away with currency and everything becomes digital, yeah. Uh, you can, there will be absolutely no secrets left in your life whatsoever because you can't, the, the government will know where your money came from, what you did with it, mm -hmm. uh, who you gave it to. I mean, every transaction will be able to be traced. And so the reason, of course, they will go to this is to cut down on, uh, you know, drug trafficking or, you know, any kind of nefarious activities, they can trace it back to the source. Because I think they could do that now. They I don't think do they that. need digital currency for that. <laughs> well, no, I was I owned a brokerage firm, mm -hmm. and so I know what it's like. You know, every morning to come in to all of these accounts that you have to check for the Department of the Treasury and so forth. But no, this will give them so much more capability. Just imagine you don't have cash anymore. I mean, all of these drug lords are found with these billions of dollars, bales and bales of $100 bills. Mm -hmm. What if there's no $100 bills available anymore and everything is digital currency? How, how's somebody going to pay for, you know, $100 million worth of uh, drugs yeah. without and hide it? They cannot. So everything will become, you know, Big Brother will know everything. At that well, point. I used to work in the restaurant industry. And I really like that cash. So, sure. that was, you know, and you didn't, you know, you weren't getting, um, you know, tracked with, with, mm -hmm. you would go out, you can go out to bars, you can go out and buy things. No one knew, you know, what you were doing. Right. Right. Um, but that, so it would affect all kinds of people. Um, and I think you're right, Ken, that it, it is, it is feasible that we could transition to like, you know, Bitcoin or other digital currency. Cause I know there's a lot of naysaying about that, but, people don't remember that the monetary system used to be backed by gold, right? And there was a time you couldn't even imagine that you wouldn't have a, a system, a monetary system backed by something substantial. And then it became printed money. Um, and so that was, that, that is the next step towards this digital currency where basically it's, we it's went ephemeral. To a, yeah. We went to an oil based currency after gold because, uh, oil was uh, priced around the world in dollars. But the, as they're getting more and more away from that, and there have been a couple of uh, Middle East leaders who have paid with their lives for threatening to move away from uh, dollar uh, priced oil. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, I think it's yeah. going to be, I, I, I think it's going to remain a dollar based currency, but I think that instead of, it'll be digital. Care, I, yeah, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be digital. But it's also going to be based on the new technology. So instead of oil, we're oh, going to absolutely. have an sure. economy based on hmm. on whatever this new technology is that's coming out, right. which is you know also leading to our own, I would but say, as, enslavement. <laughs> as Alan and I were saying, that take, it's going to take away more freedoms that uh, yes. you know we used to enjoy. You know, uh, 
I hate to say how many people I pay in cash to do work for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, even just, you know, your neighbor who wants to mow your lawn. I mean, geez, you know, yeah. you should be able to share, do that with a little bit of cash on the side. Okay. We have Ron, <laughs> Ron from Minnesota. You're on the air. Hey, Ron. Hey, Alan. How you doing? <laughs> Very good. Welcome. Uh, all right. Happy Sunday to everyone. And hello to... Uh, Rebecca and Ken, good to have you guys on the show. Um, Thank you. Very interesting stuff. Well, you guys were talking about the daytime guy, Kriston T. Harris, talks about all the time. He talked about the um, electric city or whatever it's called, you know, where, where everything's automated. You know, you got robots, you got electric cars. You can't necessarily go anywhere without permission, you know. Uh, of course, all your finances and your house is owned by them, whoever them are. And he asked a question a while back, would I want to live in a place like that? I said, no. Of course, like Ellen said, I would like to have somebody mow my yard. That'd be nice. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, thank you for your show and thank you for your work that you do. The question that I have is, how do you both feel and even Alan, even though he's younger than all of us, but <laughs> all, all of us, how do we feel about our timeline as far as where we are in our age? Myself, I feel pretty good because I only got at the most 30 years, just saying. Um, Health-wise, probably 20. Of course, if I keep drinking Diet Coke, maybe 10, I don't know. But anyway, um, I'm at the end of my timeline, basically. Not not right now, but you know what I'm saying. From from when I started in 1961 to now, I'm pretty much on the later part of it, right? So where do you think you are on your timeline? And do you think that anything that we're talking about right now has any um, effect on what the outcome will be later? Okay, great, great. Uh, question, Ron. Thanks so much. Uh, so, yeah, that, that I I do think about that myself too. Despite any age differences, right? I mean, what will this tech do for us as far as life extension? I think it's going to do. Um, I think it may extend our life, but the quality of life, as Ken's kind of referred to it, there's an interesting um, uh, this consciousness aspect that's come out of some of the people that I work with. One of them is Darlene Vandegriff, and she she speaks with um, about 20 different extraterrestrials. And, and what she is finding is that, the, and this is specifically what she works with, is extraterrestrials who are wanting to actually leave their species and change timelines. And I think that what we may be seeing, and there's a lot of talk about timelines, and I'm glad Ron brought it up, Ronald brought it up. There's a lot of talk about timelines and experiencers. We talk about it all the time, missing time, mm -hmm. jumping timelines, jumping, jumping into the future, coming back to the present, going into the past, coming back into the present. So time is a very fluid proposition when you open up the natural field of consciousness. And I believe that we'll be given if we stay on this trajectory of, 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 of honoring and prioritizing natural human consciousness, that we as an experiencer community are going to learn ways to literally change our timelines and that we will have different timelines happening on earth, that that the tech timeline will be going one direction and the natural human consciousness will be going another direction. But would time, I think, is very, very malleable. Would they be able to interact with each other? Oh, absolutely. Yes, hmm. of course. But they'll be going in. It's like, you know, you pull up at a stoplight and you're next and you're in a in a in a Ford Fiesta and there's a Maserati next to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, you're on the same road, but they're going a lot faster than you are. And they're going maybe in a different direction than you are. That's really what I tried to do in my book. So every chapter had 
um, a transhuman aspect. It had an exoconscious experiencer aspect. And then I tried to find the common ground. And I actually think that what is going to happen is that those who are, quote, engineering culture right now into transhumanism and digital currency that we've been talking about, they're going to need exoconscious humans because we, by, by going out into the field of consciousness and keeping our natural chakras and meridian systems alive and, and, and well, our creativity is going to surpass anything that an algorithm can bring. An algorithm can probably bring more data, but it also depletes the earth. It also um, harnesses creativity. Actually, there are studies done about human creativity now since cell phones and since computers, and mm -hmm. the creativity rate of humans has actually dramatically declined. Well, I, I, I can agree to some degree uh, because, because there are those creatives who work in the digital world. They're digitally mm -hmm. creative. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those of us who were raised in a more analog or hybrid digital analog, it, it's affected us. Is there a difference uh, between age groups at all? Um, be, because I wonder if my, my you know, younger nieces um, aren't, um, you know, uh, aren't losing their creative abilities with digital just because I, I they think, grew up with it. Yeah, I, I think that is what's happening. And I think also critical thinking skills are mm. being dampened. Well, that that I certainly can, can and agree with to a degree. They come from the same place. I mean, when you yeah. are, you know, your third eye is awake, let's say, just to mm -hmm. ask something specific. When your third eye is awake, then you're moving out into the field of consciousness and you're you're putting patterns and correlations together like, like Ken did, I'm sure, when he was working in finance. I mean, you're able to see things in a big, broad picture instantaneously. Well, An algorithm know, just does data. Yes, I, I bought these right here, these glasses. These are blue light filter glasses because especially during the pandemic, I was spending so much time yeah, and these prevent headaches, but yeah, I, I, light. yeah, I, I have experienced a sort of fogging of the brain <laughs> sometimes um, because I spent so much time mm -hmm. on screens. It's crazy. Um, so we have another call from uh, Bobby. You are on paranormal now with Ken Cherry and Rebecca Hardcastle, right? Hey, Bobby. Hello, Alan. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Ken. I'm right now with Axel Producing and Guest. And I do have a question for for Ken and Rebecca since uh, privacy was actually was mentioned. Uh, the question is that that uh, are we going to have to be aware about what we say or what we do, especially when we interact mm -hmm. on social media or any website. So um, I'm just wondering if you're not going to be careful now in these days of what you do. Okay. Thanks so much, Absolutely. Bobby. Absolutely. I mean, they're already monitoring everything you, you say and do on social media. And uh, they've made it pretty clear that they want to be able to censor whatever you say on private email. So via Instagram, whatever other means that there may be. But uh, this is all working towards homogenizing uh, peoples and cultures. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, just think of the effect of television. Many years ago, people used to have such distinct uh, uh, regional accents, for, for instance. Uh, but with television, uh, national broadcasting particularly, they came out with a kind of a level, uh, non-distinct manner of speaking. And over the years, it's leveled out a lot of the, you know, a lot of the dialects, if you will, that we used to have in the country. Hmm. And so, I mean, if you look at the broad, the big picture, everything is working towards homogenizing making us part of a hive, uh, mm -hmm. thinking the same, agreeing with one another. And in the name of peace and harmony, we are losing our uh, 
you know, some of our uh, creativity and technological edge. I mean, it's fewer and fewer people who really are the tip at the tip of the spear in terms of, you know, new developments in the world. So, if, yeah, if we can bring this out back to the UAP task force report, um, is there any ulterior uh, motive uh, mm. besides just getting money for, for weapons or development um, that could be related to, to all this that we've been discussing? One of the things I keep wondering, and I, I, this is just a question, I, I don't really have an answer, but it seems to me um, that looking at, you know, that having explored for several years now, very deeply into transhumanism and this artificial field of consciousness that being created and Ken said the magic word hive mind, I'm, I'm really wondering and whether or not what we're seeing with the transhumanism, the planetary, it's planetary transhumanism, that there are certain extraterrestrial races working with um, the government and intelligence and, mm -hmm. and military on these projects and not others. Mm, I can answer that. Okay. Yes. So, so, and once I write about that in my book too. So, go right. So, 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 once we open ourselves and say, "I'm, I'm maintaining, however possible, my natural field of consciousness," then mm -hmm. we are opening access to all those other races that aren't involved in this. And I am. Um, mm, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, uh, one of the scientists that I uh, spoke with off the record uh, actually. He gets his paycheck through NASA, but he's really paid to back engineer alien technology. Mm. And uh, I said, why are we studying, you know, back engineering for since <laughs> since Roswell? He says, well, there's like 20 different um, races that come to the Earth and a lot of their science is totally different. I mean, you know, so they have different kinds of uh, propulsion systems, for example. Um, but getting back to your question about the UAP report, uh, don't forget we have this new Space Force now. And so a lot of the, 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 a lot of the result of this report, what they're pushing for, is going to end up at, under the control of the Space Force. Mm -hmm. uh, the Space Force is already taking over a number of programs that the Air Force and the Army have, and they're putting in uh, super radar stations around the Earth. They're talking about putting one in the UK right now, one in Australia. But this super radar, which is a very advanced type of radar that they've developed that can reach out and identify objects 22,000 miles out into space. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's more than double the ability we have now, mm -hmm. and it's a tremendously more sensitive. So a lot of the what they're asking for here, uh, new technology to develop and more money, that's going to end up in the Space Force. So uh, don't overlook that, you know, as a as a motivation for uh, we want money, we want money, we need more data, <laughs> we need <laughs> we need more toys. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway. That's, uh, that's I, I, I totally agree with Ken. I think that what what the UAP report is going to bring is a lot of to to transparency and to the market. We're going to see a lot more um, advanced radar equipment in 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 aircraft, in space, yeah. in satellites. But the uh, some of what the that's report, going to be a, a big a big aspect. Yeah, some of, of what the reveal. The report, right, what some of what the report does say and what you just mentioned is the new technology that's needed it, they actually say a lot of the technology we have now is not it's developed for a specific purpose and they mm -hmm. filter out other things that might not enable us to see these uaps and so we need this new uh, radar so a lot of these new uh dod films that came out the the tic tacs the gimbals that sort of thing a yeah. lot of that was a result of new technology that those planes had on them that was yeah. able to lock onto those things where they'd never been able to before. Yeah, Ken, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was 
the one point in the report that I thought stood out the most to me, because that, that was the only thing that was really novel, you know, that we need to do something different. We need new technology um, yes. as opposed to let's just collect some reports, put it together, read it, look at it and make an assessment. They're, they're actually saying we need to actually, you know, build some nuts and bolts uh, systems here. So guys, we're at the very end. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, for everybody out there, I just want to let you know, I would not be here doing this, hanging out with you if it were not for Ken Sherry right up there and Epic Voyages Radio. So Ken knows I love him. He's a friend. Thanks so much for joining Ken. Um, and Thank you can you. find his book, Mark Slade Investigates the Stephen UFO at Amazon and Rebecca Hardcastle, right? Where should people go to find your works? Um, exoconsciousness.com and my book, Exoconscious Humans is up on Amazon. Rebecca, thank you so much. You're, thank you're, you. Thanks. You're, Wonderful meeting you, Ken. Nice to meet you yeah, as well. So great. great. Hey, uh, Alan, tell thanks, them Alan. to book me up on Gaia too. The great interview. Sure. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll put the link in the description as well. Um, and Rebecca, I always appreciate your insights. Oh, thank you, you. You're, you're, you're studious and you know so much. I, I really thank you both thank you. tonight. Thank you. All right. That's it for Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith on KGRADB.com. If you want to find out more about this show, go to KGRADB.com and you can find out how to stream and get special member access every Tuesday. I'm sorry, every Sunday. We used to be Tuesdays. Every Sunday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. I want to thank my producer, Bill Skywatcher, Race Hobbs, and Eric Brager. And until next time, everyone, live in the mystery. <laughs>